Welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast, where faith and sports collide. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This is episode number 43 of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on the show today. We do appreciate you listening and tuning in subscribing, downloading this podcast wherever you may find them. Of course, we're on Apple Podcasts, on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, everywhere podcasts are found. And you can always find every single episode of the podcast as well as a written sort of recap of the podcast with quotes and our favorite topics and things like that over at sportspectrum.com. Today's guest is Tim Fortugno. Now, he is a former Major League Baseball pitcher and currently a scout with the New York Mets, and he's been in baseball for over 30 years now, long time. But he is probably one of the more unlikely people that you would ever think could make it to the major leagues. Tim lived a rough life early on. He grew up in a broken home. He had a stepfather that was very, very abusive to him, both physically and verbally. Uh, He came to a point where he tried to end his own life and then ended up getting his girlfriend pregnant and marrying her at a very young age, 18 years old, and having a child. Uh, He ended up pursuing baseball, having it taken away from him, then pursuing it again. At 30 years old, he makes the major leagues uh, improbably after years in the minor leagues, and the stepping stones that it took to get to the major leagues are about as unlikely as you'll ever hear. And Tim is also a Christian, and he was adopted and taken into foster care and introduced to Christ um, from a mom and a dad who cared about him and and showed him what faith was and what it meant and how it could help him in his life. This is a very encouraging and interesting story. It's 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 a wonderful discussion with Tim. You may not have ever heard of him, Uh, But his story is powerful, and that's what this podcast is about, is bringing you stories of faith and sports, some of the people you've heard of, and some you haven't. Um, So without further ado, let's get right to it. This is our podcast, episode number 43, with former Major League Baseball pitcher, current Mets scout, Tim Fortugno. Tim, welcome to the Sports Spectrum Podcast. How are you? I'm doing well, Jason. Thank you for having me, man. I can't tell you how much of an honor and a privilege it is just to be on your show. I mean, you've had some really cool guests. Um, I've listened to your podcast many, many times, and I really look forward to our conversation today. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We're grateful to have you here. Your story is awesome. I'm really excited to, to have our audience hear sort of your journey. But I want to start with currently what's happening with you. Now, you're a scout with the Mets. So let's talk about that job for a second before we go back and hear more about your incredible story. So tell us what that job, what what that entails, what that's like right now in your line of work with the Mets. Well, it's really a neat job. I feel blessed actually to watch baseball every day. Like for instance, tonight I'm going to watch the San Francisco Giants against the Diamondbacks. Um, What I do is I basically, I've done two aspects of scouting and um, with the Mets now, it's my, this is my 12th year with them. Prior to the Mets, I scouted seven years with the Texas Rangers where I scouted amateur baseball players. I went out and did high school kids. I watched college kids, and we got prepared for the draft every June. And I did that with the Mets as well for six years as their cross-checker, as their supervisor on the West Coast. And then about seven years ago, actually it's about six years ago, the Mets approached me and asked me if I had any desire to go into the pro side of scouting. And I thought about it, I prayed about it, and I actually even really thought about it, you know, long and hard. And um, and, I, and I thought it was going to be a great opportunity for me to get back in the trenches with the minor league players as well as the major league players, watch, go on their schedule, um, get prepared for trade prospects, get, get prepared for some free agent type of guys at the end of the year. So that's what I've been doing for the last six years with the Mets. But altogether, this is my 19th year in scouting. So you must have been a little busy in 2017 with the Mets because they made a lot of moves, uh, especially after the trade deadline when uh, they realized that they were out of the playoff race. Yeah, we were. We were hustling, bustling. We were getting prepared to pretty much it looks like we were going to, you know, try to get something in return for some of these guys that are going to be um, prospects. Every organization does it. They call them buyers or sellers. Um, unfortunately, this year we happened to be sellers. And so we had to get we had to let some of those guys you know, go to teams that were looking to to buy 
um, to add to their to their stack of players they have on the big leagues to get ready for the playoffs. We were out of it, unfortunately. We were just dismembered. I call it snake bitten this year, Jason. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just had so many injuries this year. It was just absolutely incredible. I've well, never Tim, seen anything like it. I was going to ask you. I'm a Mets fan. I've been a, a, a self disclosed Mets fan since Daryl Strawberry came to the major leagues in 1983. That's been my my team, the Mets. And Mm -hmm. I've never seen, and I've watched them now for 34 years, never seen a team decimated with more injuries to both their pitching and their hitting, starting relievers, power hitters, whoever, you name it, than the 2017 Mets. Have you ever seen a team this decimated with injuries? I don't think I have. And I mean, it's almost like when, I'll tell you what the, the, when you absolutely saw our number five starter, Gaselman pull a hamstring running down to first base on uh, trying legging out a base hit. You kind of knew we were snake bitten. Prior to that, our number one goes down, Noah Syndergaard. Cespedes goes down. Cabrera goes down. Duda went down for a while. Um, then Conforto goes down, swinging a bat. Um, our closer went down, Familia. I mean, it's like one guy after another. I heard somewhere along the line, Jason, and um, I never really double checked on this, but I believe it's 17 of the t- of our 25 man roster was on the DL at one time wow. before the trade deadline. And I mean, I've never seen anything like it either. Just like you said, it was incredible to watch the guys go down. As a matter of fact, I think after 60 games, I kind of threw the white flag out myself. I thought that, okay, this is, this is just not our year. And uh, for the first 60 games, I had some hope that we could rebound. I had some po- hope that we were going to do better. But it just seems like it just it's not in the cards for us this year. Guys are just getting hurt. We need to get healthy um, going into this offseason, and we need to rebuild this thing going into 2018. Absolutely. I mean, injuries are a part of the sports for sure, and teams have to overcome them. But I've just never seen anything like this this year's Mets squad. So mm. we'll just hope that they get better and hope that they can return to health and then at least have a chance next year, a chance to, to compete and to battle for a playoff spot. We're talking to Tim Fortugno here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Now, Tim, your story is is powerful. Your story is incredible. I think a lot of our audience has no idea, though, what you've been through. So I really want to get deep into this story and start going back because – it's powerful, and it's an important story, I think, that can help a lot of people. So let's start your times as a youth growing up. I know you grew up in a broken home. Just kind of give us a little background on what life was like as a, as a young kid for you. With well, true, <clears throat> excuse me, it is true. I did come from a broken home. My mom, my mom was divorced. Um, my dad, when I was six years old, she was raising four kids on her own. But then she remarried when I was 12 to a man that was extremely abusive, mentally and emotionally. He was sexually abusive towards my sister. Um, I feel he was also abusive towards my mom. Um, And I mean, you know, I'll give you ultimately what ended up happening between the ages of like 11 through 16 years old. I lived under that roof where it was, uh, you know, it was just so emotionally abusive and, and I was so emotionally distraught. I started making tons and tons of bad decisions. I began to rebel. Um, I started doing drugs. I started doing alcohol. I started doing B&Es, breaking and entering into neighbors' homes, stealing their money, stealing families' money. Mm. Um, and, and, and a lot of that rebellion took place because my my stepdad took away the one love that I had in my heart, the one love that I had in my soul, and that was baseball. Once he took baseball away from me, I became the most rebellious kid. And what I saw him doing to my sister, what I saw him doing to my family, how he was just, my mom was doing a good job raising the kids on her own. Um, I know it was hard for her, but when he came in, it really just threw us all completely off and got me completely out of kilter. I became a truant. I started skipping school. Um, then I had to go to court to pay the price and listen to, you know, what, you know, to pay for my penalties, if you will. And I was rejected at that moment by my mom. I was rejected by my stepdad. They didn't want me home anymore. So I got placed into foster care at 16 years old. And, um, truthfully at that point, Jason, I'll be honest with you, there was some kind of peace that was some taking place. It was almost like I felt this inner peace and I didn't know where it was coming from, but it, actually felt like, you know, now the truth is going to come out. Everybody's going to know what's going on. 
Now, I do kind of want to remind you is that back then in the uh, mid 70s, um, early 70s, late 70s, you know, people didn't talk about sexual abuse. People didn't talk about what was going on behind closed doors very much. Mm-hmm. It was very hidden. Um, it's very embarrassing. Um, and it was just humiliating. So you try to really, and so the only way I knew how to deal with it is just get into a total rebellion. So, but I got placed into a foster care home and truthfully, uh, little did I know, but I got placed into a Christian home and that would be the beginning of my redemptive story. Let me, let me go back a little bit. There's a lot there. Uh, and I I don't Mm want to go, I'll go as deep as you're willing to go on this, but there's a lot there. First off, you said the father, not your stepfather, but your actual father wasn't there. What, what, what was that situation? Did you have any communication with him, any relationship with him at all? Yeah, I grew up in a small town in Clinton, Massachusetts. At the time, I think it was a total population of about 5,000. I think it's up to 10,000 today. But back then, it was about 5,000, so a real small town. And my dad used to, he used to, we did see him. But he was definitely missing in action. He didn't live up to his his um, obligations to my mom. Um, he didn't pay his bills, but he was supposed to pick us up on Sundays. I can remember going to my grandmother's house every Sunday, my grandmother's and my grandfather's house. And we used to, after church, we used to wait until my, my father would come. But he would be a no-show um, 90% of the time. And I can just remember being let down. And then all of a sudden, it became almost like normal. It was almost like, well, he's just not going to be there. So we stopped looking for him. But I do know our hearts were broken. And my mom used to make a lot of excuses for him mm. and saying, oh, he must be busy today. He'll be here next week. And so I did know that he was around, but I didn't see him because I was so young. So and, Yeah, and then you come into this situation with your stepfather and the abusiveness of him, of his, of the way he is. And you said something that made me just want to ask this question. You said that he took baseball away from you. Did he legitimately just not allow you to play? What did you, what do you mean by that? When you say he took baseball away from you? Well, I got two examples of, of exactly how he did that is one year. And it was very, I didn't make the all-star team very often. But I made the all-star team this one particular year, and he, um, we were going on vacation. We went to Lake Winnipesaukee, and I think it's in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And my coach loved me, um, and he was willing to bring me to the all-star game and then drop me back off up at our vacation for the week. And my stepdad said, no, he can't go. And so that was the first time, and I felt hurt because I didn't make all-star teams every year. But the second time that I made it was my freshman year. I mean, that he took it away from me was my second year and my first year in high school was my freshman year. I was a straight A student, mind you, prior to this. Um, my mom really instilled in us, you have to work, you have to do your homework first before you go outside and play. But I was a straight A student. But then my freshman year, now he was living with us at this point for about three or four years. So slowly but surely, I was starting to feel his angst. I started feeling anxious all the time. I started feeling rebellious on the inside. And I got, I let it, I started letting my grades slip. So one time I got to see my freshman year during the, during the, the winter break. And he just said, you can't play baseball your freshman year. Mm. It's, and he took it away from me. Whereas my coach, I tried out in the, and the varsity coach wanted me to play on varsity as a freshman and he tried to talk to my stepdad and my stepdad would have none of it. He would not listen to him. He said, Nope, until he gets his grades up. Well, obviously my grades never did get up because I just got worse. I started making poor decisions. I started doing, you know, you know, I started becoming more like, if you will, I started getting away from um, that stability of hanging around the athletes in school. And I started moving over to the other group of kids that were, doing the, you know, the dope and doing the drinking and making bad decisions all the time. And so I started getting away. And then all of a sudden, by the time I got to be a sophomore in high school, Jason, I mean, nobody even wanted me on their baseball team. So it got to a point where it seemed like it was gone. Baseball was out of my life. I was no longer going to be playing baseball. And, and a lot of it had to do with just the anger, the frustration, all of this pent up frustration on the inside. Um, and I was a young kid 
And I mentioned to you earlier, you didn't talk about these kind of things out loud. Right. You just you just kind of moved along and you try to deal with things as best you could. But there was no counselors in school that was going to be there to listen. You, they were more like, hey, you know, it's like figure things out on your own. And I just didn't know how to do it. I had no idea. So you have no you have no really good example of a fatherly figure in your life. And you get placed in foster care home. You said it, you ended up in a Christian home. What happened there, and how did that how did that occur with the foster sort of situation for you, and how you ended up in that home? Well, it's interesting because I got placed in once I went to court when I was sixteen years old for doing the breaking and enterings and having to get involved in a restitution program and listening to the judge ask me, Tim, what do you want to do with your life? I basically said, Well, I want to go home, thinking the alternative was to go to jail, and I was sixteen, very naive. And then he turned to my mom and my mom says, well, we don't want him. So what ends up happening is the, the welfare state of Massachusetts took my care and the judge at that point said, we're going to put you into foster care. So I went into temporary foster care in Worcester and I stayed there for two weeks until my probation officer would find me a long term place that would allow me to stay there until I was 18. And little did I know, but, you know, I had no idea where I was going to be going and either did my probation officer so, but he had an idea after getting to know me for a little while. So he talked to this family out in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. Their names were Kenny and Vicki Graves. They lived on a 60 acre farm, raised animals, um, and they were born again Christians. Mm. And that's where he decided, he thought I had a chance. He didn't think I was a bad kid. He thought that I would do well in this environment. So he put me there on a two week basis, two week trial for them. And a two week trial for me to see if there was um, if we could coexist in the same place. And all I can remember is Kenny and Vicky saying to me upon arriving in their home is, Tim, we only have we don't have rules here, except we just ask you not to bring drugs into the house. And we ask you to either go to school or get a job. It's your choice. And so they said, if you can do that, you can stay here until you're 18. So I uh, decided to go back to school, and I decided not to do drugs, and the environment was really different. I was not expecting where, what it was that I was getting into, and um, it turns out that I, it was a born-again Christian family. Had you had any faith or, or religion in your life at all before this moment? Prior to that, my mom made us go to church one day a week. I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. and I went to catechism. I don't remember if I went to catechism one day a week or one day a month, but I remember going on a Tuesday, and I remember nuns being in the school, and, uh, you know, it was kind of somewhat of like a babysitting place to go to after school, but I don't, I never learned in my first 16 years of life, I never learned what it was like to have a personal relationship with Christ. I thought it was more ritually oriented, I went into church. I remember doing the, you know, the Our Father um, prayer. I remember, you know, hearing the priest, but basically tuning them out. I so I didn't grow spiritually whatsoever. I never even knew there was a such thing as having a personal relationship with Jesus. I learned that when I entered my foster home when I was sixteen years old. So take me to between the ages of sixteen and eighteen, because there's a poignant moment for you at eighteen years old. Uh, that we'll talk about in a second, but give me a give me the Cliff Notes version of sixteen year old Tim to eighteen year old Tim. Well, when I moved into that foster home my junior year in high school, um, I had no idea that they were Christians. Like I said, but while living there, I got exposed to going to Bible studies, going to coffee houses on Friday night where they played Christian music. They had Christian bands in there. We watched Christian movies, and I received a lot of Christian counsel from Kenny. Um, Kenny's gift in life was being able to really listen and, and weed out all of those issues that I was having, all that pent up frustration and slowly, but surely, and it was slowly, I ended up getting out those feelings of anger and frustration and even felt remorseful for the things that I had done. Repentful, if you will. And so I can remember my senior year. Um, which was January of 1980, I decided to give my life to Christ. And I just, it, it, it wasn't any kind of like epiphany or anything like that. It was just more of me looking back saying, God, you delivered me 
You saved me. You took me out of an environment was that was so abusive um, mentally and emotionally. I didn't know how to handle my anger. I didn't know how to handle my frustration. And yet here is Christ saying, Tim, I'm going to be your savior for the rest of your life. I've got your back. And I'm going to go ahead and guide you and, and, and lead you from here on. So it was... It was not like this thing where God spoke to me loudly and audibly. It was just more of this. He was just, you know, putting his hand on my shoulder saying, I got you now. Don't worry about it. I've always had your back, as a matter of fact. And Jason, can I, I want to intercede. I want to um, include this one thought is, and I didn't tell you about, about this feeling that I had when I was 15 years old. I remember going to bed one night. And I remember going to bed and having this feeling of I wanted to kill myself mm. I, or I wanted to kill my stepdad. So I brought a knife to bed one night and I was screaming in my pillow at, during one of my groundings that I was receiving from him. And I wanted to kill him or I wanted to kill myself. And God said, Tim, you don't need to do that. I felt I sensed his spirit saying, don't do this. You don't have to do this. And it was about a year later that I ended up doing those breaking and enterings, breaking the log, going to court and being placed into this home. And so it was a real interesting e epiphany that I was having at 16. It was almost like, wow, God, you did have my back this whole time. So when I was 18 years old, I recognized by looking back that God was always there. I just couldn't quite hear him in my distraught. So that moment when you're wanting to kill your stepfather or kill yourself, are you thinking along the lines of somebody's got it? This has to stop somehow. So either I can control it one way by ending his life, or I can control it another way by me ending and ending my life. Is that kind of your thought process? I mean, it's 15, so it's such a, a, a difficult age just to just to be a normal kid at that point. And mm -hmm. you're having these serious thoughts to the point where you put a knife under your bed. So as you're thinking like, I just need to end this right now somehow because the pain is just too much. I did. I needed to save my mom. I needed to save my sister. I needed to save my brothers. I mm. needed to save all of us. And I felt it. I felt strong in that urge. But God was there just saying, don't. You don't have to do this. I, now, I didn't. Now, I do want to say, I didn't really know it was God. I just felt and sensed him. Sure. And I, and I, I felt like he was saying, somebody was telling me, a, a strong force was telling me, don't, you don't need to do this. And this is going to be okay. And so, but I think you're right in, in, in your, you know, evaluating that is, is that that's true, is I did need to kind of come to the forefront and do something about this. Uh, uh, your senior year of high school, is baseball back in the picture for you? Yeah, by the time I got into that foster home, I actually got in there in, right before Christmas of my junior year in high school. And my step, my, my foster dad, my, I call him my Christian dad today, Kenny, he um, and Vicky, my Christian mom, they both said, Tim, you like baseball, don't you? And they, and they said, why don't you go try out for the baseball team? And so I did. Hmm. And it just and it just so happens I was just good enough. I was left-handed, had a pretty strong arm, and um I just kind of I fit in for some reason. My coach took me in and uh so I got back onto the baseball field and played not I played in 18 games my junior year and then I played in 18 games my senior year and uh I'd even won co-MVP on my senior team and um to this day, my high school coach and I still have a great, great friendship. So, and we're talking to Tim Fortugno here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast, former MLB pitcher, and we'll talk about his journey to the majors in a minute. He's currently a scout with the New York Mets. And this is fascinating to me, Tim, because a couple levels here. First of all, you become a believer in Jesus Christ and your life is, in essence, never the same. But when, I think there's a good lesson here for our listeners, because when we become a Christian, when and especially those who who aren't believers that are listening to this podcast, and I know we have quite a few that, that listen that aren't Christians. When we accept Jesus Christ, there is a perception that everything just gets better. Everything is perfect, and life is a bunch of flowers and blue skies, and everything's great. And that is the furthest thing from the truth, I think, that anybody could happen, because there's still struggles. There's still this you know sort of world that we have to live in that is a broken, fallen world. So for you, 
as quickly and as awesome as your life is living with your Christian foster care parents, playing baseball again, back to the thing that you love the most, 18 years old comes and you say goodbye just as quickly as you said hello to your <laughs> baseball dream. Things happen even after you became a Christian. Take us back to 18 years old and, and what happened for you to have to say bye to baseball. Truthfully, I've learned in my life that God does have a purpose for each and every one of us and that he does have, a, you know, a plan. And at that time at 18, I decided not to stay. God said, hey, Tim, I want you to go to California. Mm. And that happened because somebody close to my Christian family was going to move there. And they asked me if I'd be willing to go to California. And I was like, my hand went straight up, like, I'll go. And I mean, I had no plans. Uh, no college recruiters ever talked to me. No, no professional baseball scout ever even saw me pitch a game. I thought baseball was done. So I jumped on the back of a Ford pickup truck and started heading towards California. And we ended up moving to Bakersfield. Two months after I got there, after I went to that retreat center, um, and then I moved down to Southern California, I jumped on a Greyhound bus from, check this out, I jumped on a Greyhound bus in Bakersfield, and the Greyhound bus drove down to Newport Beach and dropped me off at this red telephone booth, which, by the way, is still there. I was there last year, and I went down to Newport Beach in front of the Rusty Pelican restaurant, and there's that red telephone booth, and I took a picture of it, and I thought, I can't believe it. This is where it started, and I ended up getting dropped off with a, a cardboard box. That was my suitcase. I had my baseball glove in there, and I had my trophy from winning co-MVP on my baseball team. And I had a couple of clothes, and that was my only belongings I had. No family, nobody that I knew in Southern California except this one guy that was going to come by and pick me up. And after being down at the Newport Beach on 34th Street, uh, just imagine um, from pier to pier, there must have been thousands because this is in the middle of the summer. It's in July. Of uh, after I graduated my senior year, there's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people, a sea of people <laughs> on the coastline. And here comes this one guy who comes up and I saw and I met him up at the retreat center and he sat down with me. and He said, Tim, and his name was Clive. And I'm saying, Clive, what are you doing here? And he said, I was going to ask you the same thing. What are you doing here? I says, well, I'm starting to get low on funds. I probably need to get a job. I've been coming down to the beach every day for the last six weeks. And, you know, I need a job because I'm running out of money. He goes, well, why don't you go up to the South Coast Plaza? They are hiring waiters and waitresses because school's about to start. Hmm. And they're going to have a drop off of employees. And so why don't you go up there and interview? So I literally got on a, a skateboard the next day and rode all the way up. It was about four or five miles from where I lived. And I had no idea where the South Coast Plaza was. This was before GPS. This was before Internet. I just went on his directions and I just went up to that South Coast Plaza, found my way into the restaurant, did an interview with a uh, manager by the name of Carol, did an interview but with a manager by the name of John. And this was on a Tuesday. And they said, Tim, we're going to call you on Thursday. So I went back to my apartment in Newport Beach, uh, waiting for the phone to ring. And, and, and I just go, Wednesday comes. And I had, really, I had nothing else to do. So I decided instead of going to the beach, I think I'll go back up to the South Coast Plaza and see if they made a decision on Wednesday instead of waiting for the phone call on Thursday. So I went up there on Wednesday and I said, I know it's quick. I know you said you were going to call tomorrow, but I thought I'd show up here. And ask if you've made a decision. And they said, Tim, it's so weird that you showed up today because we interviewed three Tims yesterday. And that is no, no lie. He says that we interviewed three Tims. <laughs> you were one of them. And we liked all of you. We just didn't know who we were going to hire. But seeing you showed up, we are going to hire you. So I got the job. But the best part of this story is I met a girl that was working there who ended up becoming my wife 36 years ago. Hmm. And she was working in that same restaurant as a waitress. And somehow we just hit it off. And God just told me almost immediately, Jason, if I, I, I don't necessarily believe in love at first sight, but if there were, ever was a, a moment where this might hold true, um, 
Kelly was my wife. I mean, Kelly was the girl. And it just so happened she liked me too. So that was the good part. But it was a situation where I just knew after about two months of being around her, I just knew that this was the girl. So I asked her to marry me four months after I got to California. Four months. Yes. So quick and so young. So life is changing for you here. You're you're 18, 19 years old. You're sort of taking a back seat for baseball, trying to find a job. You find the woman that you're going to marry someday. You're still married to her. You uh, you become a dad. Obviously, you have a little baby. When does baseball come back into the picture for you? It doesn't come back in for about another. It didn't, didn't really come in for about two years after I graduated my senior year in high school. Hmm. And it happened because Kelly got pregnant. I asked Kelly to marry me. And uh, four months after I met her and her parents took us out to dinner and kind of told, asked us to reconsider this. Right. <laughs> it's happening so fast. Sure. Now, now that I have kids, I understand it. But um, I decided that, you know, I said, OK, I listened to him. But then Kelly and I, we got together one time. I, I didn't believe in premarital sex. But ultimately, we just slept one time, Jason. One time she got pregnant. Yep. And this was in December of 1980. Um, Again, it's the year I graduated from high school. And Kelly got pregnant one time. That was it. And that's all it takes, as we all know. But, I mean, I loved her. I asked her to marry me prior to that. Her parents asked us to kind of wait it out just a little bit longer. And all this did is it sped the process up. So we got married. We had to prepare for a wedding. So we got married in uh, June of 1981. And um, she was three months pregnant at that time. And so um, it just turns out that it just sped up the process. Um, I knew I loved her. I knew that God wanted me to be with her. I knew that God delivered me to her from 3,000 miles away from Massachusetts out to the coast of California and Huntington Beach. And it just sped the process up. And I will tell you, there was tons and tons and tons of hard times in the beginning, obviously. And I was very young. I would not recommend this for the rec- to the average person is because it is difficult. I mean, Kelly was so much more mature than I was. I was an immature kid that just got let, let you know, just got out of foster care, had all kinds of emotional scars, had all kinds of emotional, you know, um, and, 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 and mental abuse that I came through. And yet God knew um, that, I mean, this is God working behind the scenes is God knew that I needed somebody like Kelly because she truly is my angel on earth. And and I'll tell you what, Jason, my life did change overnight. And the way baseball came into play is that I needed a real job first. And I needed to get – I mean, I'm not even thinking about baseball. I never told Kelly I played baseball in high school. Hmm. I never told her that I that I even loved it growing up. I never told her that when I was seven years old I dreamed of wanting to be a major league pitcher someday. I never talked about it because I thought it was in the rearview mirror. It was taken away from me when I was in ninth grade. It was given back to me when I was a junior in high school. And now it was taken away from me because my senior year was over and no college recruiter came after me. No pro scout ever talked to me. I thought it was over. But I got to California, met Kelly. She got pregnant. I got married, got a job, became a carpenter, was heading to carpentry school. I was trying to become a a construction worker, possibly a contractor someday. That was my, at that point, that was my reality. That was my reality check. And then this one particular day in 1982, so this is two years out of, out of um, high school, I saw this tennis ball during a lunch break and I was on a construction site having lunch and I saw this tennis ball and I went over and picked up that something told me like that voice that was in my on my you know in my ear when I was 15 years old to say don't do this that same voice came back to me and said go pick up that baseball so I went and picked it up and I chucked it as hard as I could and my boss looked at me and says Tim you got a cannon for an arm and it was really the strangest I had this overwhelming feeling that I needed to go back and play baseball now mind you I'm married, I'm working, and I have a child now. (laughs) And I'm thinking to myself, I went home that night and I shared that story with my wife. I says, Cal, I got to share something with you. I love baseball. Um, 
And I really believe God wants me to go back to college. I really believe he wants me to go play baseball. And I mean, you should have seen the look on her face. She was so stunned. She was taken aback, almost like, I don't, well, how, Tim, how are you going to do this? I mean, we have a child. <laughs> yeah. You, we're, we're married. You got to take care of us. I mean, you got to take care of the family. You have responsibilities now. And I said, I don't know, Cal. I really don't. I, I, but I just know that that's what I'm supposed to do. And so um, the just picking up that baseball is what brought that back. So I had to start the process up of trying to find a place to play. And I knew the only place to get exposed to was in a college campus. And so I do know at the time, Kelly and I went to a couple of Angels baseball games, California Angels or Anaheim Angels um, back then. And I knew that in order to get there, you had to go to college. And I knew that there was a pretty good junior college program in the, in the area. As a matter of fact, Southern California could be one of the meccas of amateur baseball talent in the country. And so I basically found myself knocking on the doors of these baseball coaches in Southern California. I walked up to a, a man by the name of Mike Maine at Orange Coast College. It's a junior college. They won the state finals in 1981. And so that was the first college on my mind. So I went and knocked on his door. I had my son, Justin, in one hand. I had my baseball glove in the other hand. And I was up there talking to this coach. And he's probably thinking, well, where'd you come from? And he goes, well, where'd you come from, Tim? I says, well, I'm from Massachusetts. Um, and I just feel like I, I'm left-handed, thinking that that would be a good selling point. <laughs> and I said, how about, you know, he goes, Tim, you'll never make this team. You'll never make it. These players are too good. You need to go somewhere. You need to go somewhere. I got a name. I'll give you a name. So I called up this coach who took me on his team. And it was kind of a team made up of a bunch of guys that were kind of renegades, were kind of like rebels. They were from a different cause, and they come from different areas. Guys had left school when they were 21 or 20 or 20 or 18 or 19, and they had no place to go. So this, co this guy, it was called the um, Orange County Giants. His name was Red Daniels. He was a scout for the Giants, and he, he would take anybody – and so he, he allowed me to come. They played nights, so it allowed me to work my two day daytime jobs, and he allowed me to come and show up whenever I could get there on the night games. So that's what I did for about a year and a half as I did that, and ultimately while going there, just so happens that God had a coach in the stands one day who was at a Christian college, and he was the head coach, and he saw me pitch one night, and he just came up to me afterwards. He says, Tim, I don't, you don't know me. My name is Rich Emmerd, but I am a head coach at a Christian college. And I was wondering if you had any interest in going to a Christian college. And so wow. I said, I said, Coach Emmerd, I said, I'm honored. I says, I need to go home and talk to my wife about this. Um, oh, and I should share with you, Kelly came the first time Kelly ever, ever came and saw me pitch. I think I threw four pitches up against the backstop. I think I hit three or four hitters. I think I walked three or four guys. <laughs> and I mean, my, I mean, Jason, you should have seen the look on her face. That was the second look I can remember looking at her. And she says, what are you doing? Are you sure you're supposed to do this, Tim? She literally told me she didn't think I was good. And so, uh, you know, and, and she said it in her very loving way. But it was almost like, are you sure? I mean, I know there was doubt in her mind. I never wavered. I never wavered. I just felt like this is what I'm supposed to do. This is, this was in my heart. I know God gave me this talent. I know it. I know it in the deepest parts of my being that God blessed me with a strong left arm. And I just had a long ways to go. And well, so it's such a great story, Tim. And we're talking to Tim Fortugno here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. If the story ends there, it's a pretty good story. Like, you know, mm. the redemption quality of finding the Lord. You know, you end up getting married to the woman of your dreams and you end up kind of getting back and playing college baseball. And that's a pretty good story. That's one I could probably see. And you go out to the speaking units and you share it to, you know, churches or whatever. And, and life, that's a pretty good one. But it's not mm -hmm. even close to the end. And that's why I'm so fascinated by your story, because there is no reason or rhyme to this whole thing that should say Tim Fortugno is going to end up as a Major League Baseball pitcher. Just It's just not possible if you were writing this book. 
You know what I mean? If we were making up this story and I saw everything that you went through, all the brokenness from your kid, uh, from the time you were a kid growing up through your high school and being adopted in foster care, but then falling away a little bit, moving to California, end up getting pregnant at a very young age, having a kid, getting married at such a young age. Baseball is not professional baseball, major league baseball. That doesn't fit into the end of this story, but somehow for you, it did. So I want to talk about just the, just the moment where professional baseball becomes a reality for you as a major league baseball free agent in 1986. So take us to that moment. Oh yeah. Well, through those, my first, I can remember my freshman year in college, that coach that finally got me to come there and Kelly and I accepted the scholarship. It was just a, a, a small scholarship. I mean, it was, it was a lot of stuff that happened in that four years. It took me four years to finally get to a point where I was considered a prospect. Um, as, as a matter of fact, it even took less than that. But it, just for the sake of time, I'll just share with you that I ended up running into a serious arm injury in my sophomore year in college. It broke me down for about 18 months. And my arm never bounced back until the end of my junior year. And then my senior year, I'm going in at a 24-year-old senior in college. And I ultimately, um, I first of all, I recognized that I was a prospect prior to that because my coach told me, Tim, there's scouts calling me and asking me about you. And they're talking about you. And I want you to know that I played with a guy by the name of Sid Fernandez oh, yeah. when, I was in, when I was in the minor leagues. And yeah, you do know him because he was a New York Met. That's right. That's right. And, and he compared me to him, a guy who was really wild. And I was very wild in the beginning of my career in college. I was very much behind the, uh, the eight ball, if you will. I was in a major learning curve. I was completely well behind everybody else um, that had been playing baseball most of their lives, who had the supporting cast behind them, who had encouragement, who played in AAU programs, who played year-round. I was a guy who was so raw, crude, and rude, if you will, I ultimately didn't start getting, becoming polished until about my senior year in college. I'm 24 years old. I go all the way through, and I finally have my very best year, statistically speaking, Whereas I was MVP of the league. I was second team All-American. I actually put together my best stats ever. 90 innings pitched, 150 strikeouts, only gave up 40 hits. Um, but all of a sudden, that this was back in the day in 1986 where they didn't have uh, the internet and they didn't have the draft online and they didn't have cell phones. So you kind of had to go home and wait for that phone to ring at the end of my senior year. Day one goes by, no phone call. Day two goes by, no phone call. And day three goes by, no phone call. Now, here I am. I had my best year. I, I had put everything together. And I have this high hopes that this is it. And <clears throat> ultimately, um, three days go by and I get no phone call. Hmm. And then on the fourth day, I got a phone call by a scout from the Seattle Mariners. And he asked me if I had been drafted because you, nobody knew back then until you actually spoke to the player and I told that scout no nobody nobody's called me he goes well look I need you to get in your car and I need you to drive four and a half hours up to Santa Maria and I want you to pitch the second game of a double header so I left Huntington Beach that morning I drove up to Santa Maria like I said it was about a four and a half hour drive and I was ready to pitch the second game. And I was facing guys that played at Division One programs, Cal State Fullerton. Um, this is where Robin Yount's from, Pete Incavilla is from. This is where those kind of players are from. And they had a really good Division One summer league team there. And I needed to pitch against them because I went to an NAIA school, um, which was really a really small program. Hmm. And, I, and so they wanted me to prove that I can pitch against really good talent. So – I went up there, and for seven innings, I struck out 15 guys. I threw a complete game. He said, okay, get back in your car and go back home, and we'll call you. And so I drove four and a half hours back home that day after pitching seven innings, striking out 15 guys, and the phone rang the next day. And they said, hey, Tim, we want to sign you to a, to a free agent contract, but we've got no money for you. I says, well, I'll pay you guys if you'll give me a chance. That was my attitude. <laughs> wow. And, and so they drove down. They spent <clears throat> literally. His name is Bill Tracy and Warren Dewey literally spent four and a half hours at my kitchen table with my wife and my son. 
and just had a great conversation about baseball. My wife's asking about benefits. She's asking about all the important things in life. And I'm squeezing her leg saying, Kelly, don't ruin this for me. This is my chance. <laughs> and, and the scouts are like, no, these are great questions, Tim. Let her ask these questions. These are awesome questions. She needs to know this. Yes, you are going to be covered with benefits. Yes, you are going to have insurance. So anyways, I went off. I signed. By the time the conversation was over, he gave me a $500 signing bonus, uh, which to us, Back in 1986 was everything. Kelly was supporting me through four years of college. She supported me through six years of minor league baseball after this. And you're right. If his story ended there, it would be a tremendous story. But God had so much more planned for me. He had another 35 or another, what is it, 32 years of professional baseball for me. And I can't tell you how many times I felt like it was taken away from me, Jason. But God kept bringing and blessing me with it. And... You know, it's really neat that I got an opportunity to play professional baseball, and I was so ecstatic to have that opportunity. Yeah. And I got in, and I got into the system, and I had success right away. And then all of a sudden, I did hit a road bump once or twice, or three or four times. And it took me another six years after signing at 34 before I ever made my major league debut. Well, that's where I want to kind of fast forward here for time purposes, because you, like you said, you played in the minor leagues for six years. And you're 30 years old. Now, if you watch baseball, most players don't make their debut at 30 or older. It's usually before that or you're not going to play in the majors. It just doesn't usually happen. So uh-huh. you're, you're 30 years old, and, and you know this. You're a scout, obviously. But you're 30 years old, and that chance comes. You finally get a chance to get to the major leagues, the big leagues. And I want to talk about sort of what led to that, Not not the overarching – experience more or less but just the 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 couple days leading up to it what that moment was like when you get the call tim okay come come with us you're making your major league debut and it's july of 1992 unbelievable unbelievable feeling it's really true it sounds somewhat cliche but you couldn't even imagine what what strong emotions that i was feeling i mean they were so overwhelming that you know, <clears throat> I will tell you this. Prior to that, about two weeks prior, Mike Butcher, who's currently the pitching coach for the Arizona Diamondbacks, he got called up ahead of me. And everybody knew that as soon as the Angels had a need, it was going to be me. Everybody felt that. Everybody kept saying, hey, Tim, you're next. You're next. Hmm. And I was frustrated prior because I had some really good years in between that. And I thought I was going to get my opportunity, but I didn't. And I was getting frustrated. I was, you know, I, I started, you know, turning my back on God again. And I started getting frustrated. But at this moment, uh, when Mike got called up to the big leagues, I had this peaceful feeling that God was telling me, don't worry, Tim. I got you this far. Don't worry. Mm. And so when I finally got in, so I was so happy for Mike. When a lot of other players, I might be, I'll be honest with you, I don't necessarily think I was as happy For others, because I was jealous. I was somewhat envious. I'm thinking, gosh, you know, I've worked so hard. How come I'm not getting my chance? I had had those feelings. And then when Mike did, I just had a peace. God was saying to me, I've got your life, Tim. Don't you know that? And so um, I can just remember two weeks later, God says, now's your time. And then when when I got called into the office by my manager, it was just an uh, just a peaceful feeling. It was just peace. It was, I couldn't wait. And I can remember when my wife heard, she got word that I was going to get called up by one of the other wives because word trickled through real quick from the, from the players to their wives. And yeah. Kelly was waiting for me and she got found out. And it's like the angels decided to fly her and my son and my daughter down to Southern California and um, to be there for my d- major league debut. Wow, such a cool story, and having your kids there and your wife there, obviously, even better. But yep. I don't even want to talk. I don't want to talk about your first game because I've I've read stats, and it's it's obviously a memorable moment putting on that uniform and getting out there to pitch. But it's your second pit, your second ever, you know, moment as a baseball player in the major leagues, and you're starting against the Detroit Tigers, the highest scoring team in baseball. Mm-hmm. And you throw a complete game shutout. It's nine innings, three hits, no runs, 12 strikeouts. Welcome to the big leagues, rookie. What is that game like? <laughs> Holy cow. I know. It was amazing, man. Is that I the mean, best game you ever pitched in your major league career? 
Oh yes, absolutely. Hmm. Oh yeah, that's some, that's like uh, even today now being a scout and you look at if anybody throws a shutout, it's rare. Right. Um, and yet, I mean, Nolan Ryan, of course, he's got what fifty-one shutouts or whatever <laughs> it is. I mean, got, but come on, I'm not in that class. But the truth is that has got to be my 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 greatest moment. And you know, there's even a it, it's a neat story, and I'll, I'll expound on that a little bit. And it says yes, it was awesome. It was great. It was almost like. You know, God rewarded me for all of those years um, of all of those hardships that we went through. And it was like I felt like I was being rewarded. I felt like this was just a moment that, you know, nobody will ever be able to take away from me. It's just an op- it's just a rare opportunity in one's life, if you will. And I'm blessed and I really am grateful that that happened. But what's even greater and I love sharing this story even more so is that I had heard in the stands that day. And I get very emotional and choked up when I talk about this, but it's I couldn't believe when I heard from my friends that were there that my wife was just absolutely bawling and absolutely crying tears of joy. Hmm. She was so happy for me. And truthfully, I think Kelly is the main reason I had the strength, that I had the endurance, that I had the ability to persevere. Because not one time in all my tri- trials and tribulations in my 12-year career – as a professional pitcher, or 13 years actually, did Kelly ever ask me to quit? And it's like, I am so proud of her, and I am so blessed to have her, and that's the reason why God brought her in my life, because he knew I needed her, because I. Ne- you're right, Jason, people don't get to the big leagues at 30 unless there's something behind it, and for me, it was God in his strength, in his ability, his, 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 <clears throat> his given me that strength to endure all of those times, But he blessed me with a wife that was so awesome, Mm. that was so supportive. And to hear that she was crying like that, it just made me like recognize and realize that, you know, she was in this for me. And I'm thinking to myself, my gosh, Kel, you sacrificed so much. And so anyways, I I, I think the game was awesome. Obviously, it's neat. I got Mickey Tuttleton, Travis Fryman, and Cecil Fielder nine times in that lineup. (laughs) <laughs> and 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 I remember Sparky Anderson saying, I don't know who that guy is from a hole in the wall, but that was the best game thrown against us all year. Wow. And uh, I don't know why he hasn't been up here longer. Mm, <laughs> so, yeah. It was neat. That's so it's, cool. And so yeah. 1992, you're, you're spending your time now as a big league pitcher with the California Angels. And then something odd happens. And I, this isn't really this unbelievable sort of uh, motivational story that people are going to take away. I just think it's a It's a great story. And this may be the one thing that really sort of Major League Baseball aficionados know you for. So it's September 30th, 1992. You're pitching against the Royals, very end of the season. And George Brett comes comes to the plate. Now, obviously, George Brett, one of the great players of all time. He's a Hall of Famer now. At that time, he is sitting on 2,999 hits. 3,000, as many sports fans know, that's a big benchmark. You get 3,000 hits, you're probably going for the whole thing. Mm-hmm. George Brett comes to the plate in the seventh inning, and guess who's at the mound pitching? It's Tim Portugno. <laughs> so take us through that that moment, and Brett comes to the plate, and you're pitching, and you always, you're, I wonder if you were aware that he had 2,999 hits when you were pitching. Were you aware of that? I was. I think I think I was aware of it because my pitching coach came out to me and says, Tim, this guy is going to be swinging at everything. So don't give him anything to hit. Right. (laughs) And so, I mean, so anyways, you know, my nature is I'm aggressive. I'm competitive. And I am just I have this like, um, you know, uh, bulldog mentality. And I just literally threw him a fastball. I thought I was going to throw it inside, and it ended up being out and over the middle of the plate. And, you know, as my pitching coach stated, my uh, he swung at the first pitch, and he hit a wicked one-hopper at Ken Oberkfell, and it tipped off his glove, and it went into the outfield. And, of course, it's going to be a hit because it was hit so hard. Right. And um, so – he ends up getting his 3,000th hit. There was a standing ovation. There was about a five-minute standing ovation. I knew it. I didn't do it like thinking, okay, I'm going to give this up. I did it like I wanted to get him out. And, um, you know, so, yeah, I, I suppose you could say I'm just part of that trivia question. It's But that's you know, not looking, a bad thing, is it, Tim? I mean, like, I, yeah, of course you want to get him out, but you're the guy that gave up George Brett's 3,000th hit. That's not the worst thing to be associated with, right? <laughs> no. Because you give up hits all the time. Why not be you? <laughs> 
Right, right, right. Exactly. And you know what? And I think George got a hit off me prior to that, but I also got him out, I think, once or twice prior to that as well. And well, didn't I, you – let me talk about the out that you did get him out. So he gets to first base on this 3,000th hit, mm -hmm. and he's celebrating, and they're going crazy, and the fans are going nuts. His wife's in the stands. By the way, I know this because I went to YouTube. If you YouTube this, you can see the whole scenario. So Brett's <laughs> at first, and he's leading off, and then you – what's next? Tell me what happens. Tell us what happens. Well, I get a pinky from the catcher. The pinky sign from the catcher means throw to first base. Okay. And I never, ever, ever shared this with anybody. Well, prior to that, I want everybody to know on the record that in that league, I had the second best pickoff move to first base. Okay. Well, Who went to first? Uh, it was – actually, it was uh, – that year was Terry Mulholland. Okay. And over in the National League was Armando Reynoso. And I got voted as having the second best pickoff move in both leagues. Okay. So I had a, so I had a really good move. And when I got the pinky to throw over, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to throw over. So I, I try to do a real easy casual throw over move, but it just so happens George was out there at the cutout not even thinking I was going to throw to first base. <laughs> and – and, and, and he was right in the middle of telling Gary Gaetti this story about sharing with him where his family was sitting up in Section 201. And, uh, and then Gary goes to him, hey, George, I got the ball in my glove, man. So he, he had to go tag him out. And, you know, George was such a great sport about it. Um, he, guys in the, dug, in the clubhouse were telling me, Tim, you got to get a signature from him. You got to get a ball from him. Well, it turns out that uh, I didn't want to do that. He was getting bombarded by media. It turns out the next day in my locker was a baseball from George and a, and a signed bat. So That's um, cool. That's very that, cool. That's awesome. I mean, it's really neat. Absolutely. Now, so but, you pick him off, and I think the idea of watching this play, go to YouTube, people who are listening, and, and just Google George Brett or YouTube George Brett 3000 hit and watch it because his reaction – is wonderful like he's like oh you gotta be kidding me i just got this wonderful moment and you're picking me off and he's smiling and kind of just shaking his head uh just such a great moment there great baseball moment i know i know it is and i kind of wish i didn't have such a good pickoff move because maybe <laughs> i wouldn't have picked him off and you know it I, I, at the time, I had the media ask me, hey, Tim, what were you thinking? And, and, and from a competitive standpoint, I, I think I gave the politically correct answer at the time. I just said, hey, listen, it was a 3 nothing game. We were still in it. It's only the seventh inning. I really wanted to keep us close. And so I threw over. So, But, I mean, in all honesty, I mean, I, I, I kind of was told to throw over there. And I, 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 I didn't want to throw my manager under the bus way back when in 92. I was in survival mode just trying to stay in the big leagues. And so I gave a very politically correct answer. But, you know, I, I think, the, like you said, it's not the worst thing in the world somebody can be known for. But you're right. I mean, hey, look. It happened. I happened to be the guy that was on the mound at the time. At the time, I think there was only 20 players who had – no, 18 players at that time. We had only given up 3,000 hits, and so I was part of a very small group of pitchers. Absolutely. Now we're going to wrap it up here with Tim Fortugno. A couple more questions left here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. And, Tim, thank you. This has been wonderful hearing your story. Uh, your baseball career ends in 1998, so you play a few more years in the majors – your last year is 95. You end up with uh, the White Sox and then the Reds, of course, as well. And then you, put, you pitch your overseas in 1998. You were telling me before we taped this that you finished pitching in Taiwan. So I just want to ask you, and, and by that time you're 36 years old or whatever, I want to ask you how difficult was it or how hard was it for you to accept that your career pitching was over? Yeah, it, and that's such a good question because – so many players have to deal with this. There is a time where it's going to be over. And I would have to tell you that after pitching in Taiwan, I knew it was the end of the road for me. I knew it was over. I knew I was not going to get back to the major leagues. I knew it in my heart. And I, and I primarily did it for because they paid me well to go there. And, I, and after that, I just knew it was going to be over. So I struggled my first couple of years out of the game. Um, I struggled being watching Major League Baseball. And, but I really wanted to stay in the game. And so I sent my resume out to a bunch of teams and I got one little nibble from a team over here and uh, they waited till I came back to interview for that job. So I wanted to go scout and, and start stay. I wanted to stay in the game. I just didn't want to do the coaching part of it because that would put me back on buses and put me back in the trenches and um, living the, the lifestyle of a baseball player. And I really wanted to have some sort of normalcy at home. And um, be able to, my son at this point was a sophomore in high school. 
And so I really wanted to be a part of his last couple of years in high school. And so um, it was really hard to watch the game because parts of me still had it. As a matter of fact, I got a phone call from the New York Mets in 1998 to go back and pitch with them in 99 hmm. and just to go to spring training. And I just, it wasn't in my heart. It wasn't in my heart to play anymore. Hence, it might have been difficult for me to even watch. And um, part of my secondary coverage was to go into a major league stadium after I did my amateur scouting. And I really, Jason, to be all, to be per- perfectly honest with you, I really struggled going into a major league stadium for a couple of years. It was just hard for me. Yeah. Some, guy, some guys, it's not hard for them to go back. But for me, it kind of was. But now I absolutely love it and recognize the blessing that I actually had to even be there. Huh. So you get into uh, this sort of post-Major League Baseball playing career. And as you mentioned at the top, you go into scouting. And it's been 19 years now as a scout, uh, Mm -hmm. seven years with the Rangers, and then the last few with the Mets, and uh, 32 years in professional baseball, Tim. That's what I'm trying to wrap this up with here is your story – has it's there's zero possibility if I'm writing this that you end up in 32 years both playing and then working in professional baseball but that's the case here we are in 2017 in September and you're on 32 years in professional baseball and the Mets actually honored you recently is that correct they did they gave me a lifetime achievement award for being in the game for actually it was about 25 plus years and um, I got it in my 32nd year and it's just a nice for me, I'm so proud and honored at the same time that I've been able to um, live my dream. And to have this Lifetime Achievement Award just means that I can get into any major league stadium with a guest for the rest of my life. And it's uh, wow. just something I, I treasure it. I honor it. I am absolutely blessed. It makes me feel and recognize. It. For me, I took it as a sign that God, I took it as it's my symbol of this is what God has done for me. And so I'm blessed and I'm so honored to even have had this. And, and I'm really so appreciative of the Mets. And they don't even know how much I am so grateful. I've tried to share it with them a thousand times and I'm so grateful. And I just want them to know that I really appreciated that 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 honor or if that recognition if you will gosh that's the golden <clears throat> ticket tim i might have to hit you up and we can go to a Mets game <laughs> sometime but you're probably Any- gonna end up be scouting so <laughs> <laughs> anytime man God, jason anytime friend. absolutely now we're, we're wrapping up here before we go I, I always ask this question tim and your story is obviously very powerful jesus is a very integral part of all of this as you've mentioned and, and the lord's sort of hand on your life but for you, it's 32 years in professional baseball. You know, you're in your mid fifties now. I wonder for you, what has God been teaching you right now at this time? Well, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I'm just, you know, truthfully, in all those years that I scuffled and struggled and everything, I was, even though I was saved, I was a closet Christian. Mm. And he's teaching me to be more bold about my faith. He's teaching me to stay in his word daily, work at communicating with him through prayer and through his word, um, and and especially to be more patient. I mean, my wife sounds like the saint. You'd think that I would be more patient, which I'm not exactly the most patient guy in the world. And I think some of it is my upbringing. Some of it's in my DNA, but some of it is from the background and the in the baggage that I brought with me. Um, but I need to be more patient. I need to listen to Kelly more and I need to be more patient with others as well. So in the, in the bottom line is this, is to just not be afraid to share my faith with, with what God has done for me. And Jason, I, I, I don't think I've had a chance to share this with you, but that's one of the reasons why I'm honored to be on your show, because it gives me an opportunity to do what God's been asking me to do for a long time. And that is to tell others what he did for me. And it's like, this story isn't my story as much as it's, it is God's story. It's what he's done for me. And so I'm trying to be more bold and I'm just trying to be more faithful. And so I'm just trying hard because this, this, this world is so loud and it gets noisy and we get distracted so easily. And I'm looking for opportunities to just share my faith with others, especially the story that he has, you know, the story that he's brought me through, this journey that he's brought me through. I believe God, uh, especially for believers, but he provides us all with our own story. You know, one Mm -hmm. of my mottos is tell your story. I believe that's important for people. And many people don't think they're worthy enough 
or that their story matters or that they're not as popular or famous or their platform isn't as big or whatever. But mm -hmm. I believe God calls us to all share our story so that he can be glorified. And so I'm grateful for you, Tim, because I believe that that's what you're doing now. You recognize your story is not just an ordinary story. It's not just a, okay, it's a little different, but no, it, your story is a powerful story, but it can not only be powerful to people and being engaged and listening to it, but it can be powerful in the way that it points people back to the one who created us, and that is the Lord. So listen, I just appreciate you. I appreciate your your availability and telling the story. And certainly we spent a little longer than we normally do on podcasts, but your story is too good. Uh, I didn't want to sugarcoat any of it, but I just appreciate you. And I thank you, Tim, for, uh, for being a guest on the podcast. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Such a great opportunity. Thank you so much. Such a, you, you talk about the platform, you're providing it. And I just want to say thank you for giving me a chance to share this. And we do appreciate Tim Fortugno being a guest with us on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Quite the journey for that man to go from really a broken home and a very tough childhood all the way up to the major leagues and making his debut in July of 1992 at the age of 30, giving up George Brett's 3,000th hit. That was an awesome story. Loved hearing that from him. And also just how his faith has driven him in his career, in his life and uh, just how God is using him and using his story of brokenness to really inspire people and to give them an opportunity to know that, you know, Jesus is in the restoration business. And I think that's one of the things I took away from this interview is just remembering that God restores people. When we turn to him, he hears us. He listens to us. Christ died for us so that we don't have to do this alone. And that we, he nailed our sins to the cross when he died uh, and, 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 and sacrificed his life for us. And Tim's story reminds me that, you know what, no matter how broken we are, no matter how messed up we are, no matter what kind of life we've lived, no matter who's hurt us, no matter what we've done, Jesus Christ came to this earth for you and for me and died for us. And there is hope and there's healing and there is restoration in what Christ did on the cross. So marinate on that. Think about that this week. And uh, I look forward to hearing from you guys on this podcast. As always, you can reach out to us on Twitter at sports underscore spectrum or my Twitter at Jason Romano. You can always email me as well. Jason at sports spectrum.com. Jason at sports spectrum.com. Love to hear what you thought of Tim's story and any other ideas for guests that you have that you'd like to hear us uh, either write about or uh, do interviews with on the podcast. So thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next time right here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast.